and I'm a Spectra Logic Corporation, and we're hiring. If anybody's interested, talk to me afterwards. Um, so what is CTL? CTL is a SCSI target framework, and it can present a RAM disk or a file or a block device as a SCSI target device. And LUNs or logical units are only visible through uh, target-capable SIMs. The only one that is fully 100% uh, functional right now, it still has some bugs, but it's pretty well there, is ISP driver. So the four, specifically the 4 and 8 gig QLogic fiber channel cards uh, work pretty well. Um, anything else is, uh, there's some, if it has target mode support, there's some minor uh, target mode API changes that have gone in. Uh, and those uh, drivers probably need to be updated a little bit. LUNs are also available through an internal uh, CTL SIM. That's a CAM uh, device driver. And uh, uh, that allows you to use CTL without any actual hardware. So originally I wrote CTL for Copan Systems starting in 2003. And it was originally written for Linux. And because I helped write CAM, uh, CTL actually has a lot of similarities to CAM. has a lot of structural commonality there. And I actually put thousands of lines of CAM inside CTL in the Linux version. And it originally meant Copan top level because it was the top of their I.O. stack. And later I changed that to the Copan target layers because it made more sense. And uh, it's been shipping since 2005 in Copan products. And when they ported their stack to FreeBSD in 2008, I ported CTL along with it. And I was able to rip out a bunch of the CAM code because it was no longer necessary. I just used it directly. And it's actually currently shipping in Copan's, uh, or SGI's, Arcfinity and uh, 400M and 400T products. So if you look on their website, you can see uh, some FreeBSD-based products that are using CTL. And the way CTL got open sourced was that uh, Copan's assets were bought by SGI in 2010. And uh, Spectrologic, my current employer, made a deal with SGI to get the source under a BSD-style license. And the intent behind the agreement was that uh, Spectra would work to get CTL into FreeBSD. So thanks to SGI and Spectrologic, we have a, a more full-featured target framework in, in the tree and available, and it's in... Uh, FreeBSD head and Stable 9 as of er earlier this year. So some of the features of it, uh, it has disk and processor device emulation, uh, tag queuing, task attribute support, so you can do correct support for ordered and headed to queue and simple tags. Uh, SCSI implicit command ordering, and what I mean by that is, uh, say you have a uh, mode select followed by write. Well, you want to block the write until the mode select completes because the Mode select may do something that affects the execution of the write. And so you have to implicitly treat the mode select as an ordered command as it goes down through the stack. And uh, so it, it has a whole matrix of uh, first and second command types. So if it finds uh, you know, one command of type X in the queue and there's another command of type Y following it, then it controls whether you know, the following command will, will be able to keep going or whether it will get blocked has full task management support for all the different uh, SCSI task attributes, uh, BORT, LUN reset, target reset, bus reset, everything like that. Uh, it's pretty full featured in that regard. Supports multiple ports, so you can have any number of uh, front end ports. You can have 10 Q logic cards or any other kind of card if you want in the front. You can have multiple initiators logging in, uh, multiple LUNs, create pretty much as many LUNs as you like, as many as you have mem memory for and uh, multiple backend types. Uh, right now we have a RAM disk and a block and file backend, and you can have LUNs from any of the backend types all in there simultaneously. Um, it also has a persistent reservation support, and this is uh, very handy for uh, multiple initiator scenarios, um, and uh, you know, very necessary for that. Uh, mode sense and mode select support, and all the I.O. is handled inside the kernel, so there are no user land context switches. Um, you know, no copying in and out of the kernel. None of that is pretty quick in that regard. And there is basic high availability support. And the reason it is not complete is because when we got the CTL source from 
SGI, we did not get the source to their whole HA framework, and even if we had, it wouldn't have been very applicable to FreeBSD in general. It's very uh, specific to their hardware platform. So in order to make uh, high availability useful, what we would need to do is um, actually put in a, a framework, a communication mechanism in place that would, you know, and repl probably replace the stubs with whatever our new high availability communication framework is. It's got, uh, it's set up essentially to do um, active, active high availability uh, between two nodes. Uh, doesn't really do more than two nodes right now. Uh, it has the ability to do the data transfers in between two CTL instances directly or implicitly uh, if, say, you're on top of a clustered file system and the clustered file system is doing the memory mirroring in between instances, it can handle that as well. So there are two different HA modes in there, and you can kind of see that uh, in the code if you go poke around in there. So uh, this is the structural layout of CAN, and I'm going to show how it relates to CTL in just a second. But um, so up at the top, you know, you have user land, you have read, write, and IOCL system calls that goes in, go into the uh, DA direct access, CD, CD-ROM, and SA sequential access for tape drives, drivers. So this, that's the peripheral driver level is the first layer inside the kernel. And then down below that is the CAM XBT or transport layer, and that's the mid-layer in CAM that routes all the commands through uh, from the top to the bottom. Uh, down at the bottom level is the SIM layer or the uh, device driver layer in CAM, and uh, you see the ISP and MPS drivers there. Uh, those are just two of a ton of different uh, device drivers in CAM. So this is the basic CAM structural layout. Now when you add CTL to the picture, here's what it turns into. So there's a lot more stuff. Um, and so at the top, you see the CTL peripheral driver just beside SA. And I guess I got, I got this little pointer here on. If it works, no. Oh. No? Okay. I don't know quite how to make this thing work, but anyway, uh, so up beside uh, the SA driver is the CTL peripheral driver, and that's where most of the commands come in. Uh, there's also an internal initiator um, or a CAM SIM driver down at the bottom. See so CTL to CAM, that's that. CTL has, <coughs> at the top, there are front end ports. So there are uh, several front end ports. There's the main command execution part of it that decodes all the SCSI commands and does all the, the basic processing. And down at the bottom are the back ends, uh, like the block and file back end, which is what you use to uh, uh, sit on top of a, any, DA, you know, any disk device or any file in the file system, and a RAM disk. The RAM disk is a uh, fake RAM disk in the sense that um, it just uh, tosses the data away. The idea is that you can have a RAM disk of any size you want, and it only has a megabyte of memory backing it, and the I.O. just goes straight through, and um, it doesn't really uh, save your disk. So it's not for data integrity testing. It's mainly for bandwidth testing. Okay, so here is how a normal command would come into CTL and get executed. And we're going to assume, in this case, that it's coming in via the QLogic driver over fiber channel. So it starts off in the SAN bottom left, and then goes into the ISP driver, then comes into the CAM transport layer, and then comes into the CTL uh, peripheral driver. Now, this is a target peripheral driver in CAM. In CAM, you can have initiator peripheral drivers like uh, DA and CD and SA and pass-through driver, and you can have target peripheral drivers like this one. And so this is a target peripheral driver in CAM. And then from there, it goes into CTL itself, and this is where the uh, SCSI commands get decoded, figures out is it a test unit ready, a read, a write, an inquiry. You know, what is it? That's where it figures it out. It also decodes uh, which line it is and uh, therefore which backend it goes to. And in this case, it's going to the block and file backend, and from there it goes out to whatever your backing store is that you've configured for the line. So this is the normal command path. Um, so for the internal initiator, and this is what you use if you don't have any actual physical hardware in your box 
to, do, to use a CTL, uh, here's what happens. So you start off in user land or in your file system doing a read, or write, or, not, or you know, possibly an IOC, but really a read or a write. And it will go into the DA driver, just like any normal IO would. And then you go to the CAM transport layer after that. And then it gets routed down to the SIM, which is right here, the uh, CTL SIM, uh, which is a front end port in, into CTL. And then from there it gets routed into the main part of CTL where the command gets decoded. And then it goes to the block and file back end in this case. It could go to the RAM disk uh, to get executed out to the disk. And the interesting thing is you actually wind up going back through CAM. So in this case, you go back into the DA driver, probably. I mean, assuming you're on a CAM device, you know, through the transport layer and then, say, out through the MPS driver and down onto the disk. So you, you make a couple trips through CAM in this particular case. So this is uh, the user land path. So uh, CTL ADM talks to an IOCTL. CTL ADM is the primary configuration utility for uh, CTL. There's also a statistics program called uh, CTL STAT. CTL ADM is the primary uh, way you configure lines and kind of, it's got a whole bunch of different functions, does all kinds of things. Um, so anyway, you start off in CTL ADM, you go through the IOCTL front end port, it's a separate front end port in the CTL. Then you go into the command decoding and then say it's a read or a write and you go into block and file back in. So how can you use CTL? There are a lot of different ways to use it. Uh, you can kind of turn a FreeBSD box into an external RAID box and this is how Copan used it uh, originally and they're still using it. Um, and anybody can do this. All you need is a fiber channel card right now and uh, you know, later on hopefully other types of cards like iSCSI and FCOE. Um, you can do error injection testing. So last fall, I implemented descriptor, SCSI descriptor sense support for uh, CAM and FreeBSD. This was precipitated by, um, we found some uh, three terabyte Seagate SAS drives that by default had uh, SCSI descriptor sense enabled. And descriptor sense, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is just a, a newer form of error reporting for SCSI. It's, uh, you know, got a more modular uh, approach, and it, it's just a different way of reporting errors. And so we had to support this because they're devices that have it turned on by default. And so because of that, um, I actually wrote all the CTL support, so all the target side support for, descriptor, for generating descriptor sense first. So I wrote my tests first, and then I wrote all the support in CAM itself on the initiator side uh, to interact with the target side. And so I was able to write a complete set of tests for descriptor sense and verify that everything worked correctly. At the same time, I also uh, fixed the, a lot of the sense residual handling in the kernel with some help from Marius Strobel and uh, you know, fixed a lot of drivers that were not properly handling uh, sense residuals. And all this I was able to prototype and test in, with CTL in ways that would not have really been possible if I had had a, uh, a regular disk drive, because you just can't get all those errors out of a normal disk drive. And so you can do, you know, with the SCSI testing without actual SCSI hardware. So if you want to do it on your laptop in a VM, you can totally do it. You've got a full SCSI decoding thing in there. Uh, you can do HVA bandwidth testing with the RAM disk back end and prototype new OS features. Uh, FreeBSD developer is under contract with the foundation. Traz has done some interesting work with GrowFS, and he's been using CTL as his test framework because he can go in. He, he wrote the changes to increase the size of a LUN and then generate a unit attention. The DA driver notices, and this all percolates up the stack, and then he's able to go grow the file system uh, after the the disk device increases in size, but he's able to use CTL as a prototype, prototyping system for it. So there's a lot of stuff you can do, even if you're not trying to build an external RAID box. Uh, you can use it for testing and all sorts of other stuff. So 
Now I'm going to give a little demonstration of kind of how you configure it and use it and uh, a little bit of what you can do with it. So let's see. So right here, uh, it's a little bit, a little bit of a wide terminal here and a small screen. Um, so I have a FreeBSD VM, and it's uh, running nine stable. And look at the list of devices, and uh, you see the CTL to CAM bus. Yeah. Okay. You see the CTL to CAM bus there. And that's the internal sim. So I'm going to create a new one. And I'm going to create it with a RAM disk back end. And let's uh, create it with a very large size, because we can. So that's 1048, 576, and a lot of zeros in terms of, uh, I think that's bytes or megabytes. I can't remember which one. But anyway, you can just keep adding zeros, and it doesn't really matter. You can. Just do that, and that's how much, oh yeah, it's bytes. Okay, so I created a RAM disk there, and now I'm going to um, create um, a block device, a block back device. And in this case, I have a uh, one terabyte file, or one gigabyte file, I think, yeah. It's sitting in my home directory that I just used to create that. So the test disk file's right there. Okay, so now I can uh, take a look at my uh, 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 LUNs and said CTL using the devlist command. And I can see that I have one owned by the RAM disk uh, back end and one owned by the black back end. And now what I need to do is to put my ports online. Normally, uh, when you configure CTL, it doesn't come up with your ports online. It comes up with them offline because you don't want to present all your LUNs. You don't want to present your LUNs until, your port, un, until they're all done. You don't want to do it incrementally because the initiator usually only does one read uh, report LUNs. So I turn the port on, and there, there it is in the uh, CAM control dev list. You know, I can do BD. You know, just did a DD off of the RAM disk. I can do things like uh, inquiry. You know, it's a previous DCTL disk. It's pretending it's 800 megabytes a second. I can do things like uh, error injection. Yeah. Okay, so this is a kind of complicated error injection that's uh, using descriptor sense. And this is one of the things I used to test the descriptor sense code. So, OK. And then I get this interesting error message here. And you know, you'd never see anything like this in real life, but this is all custom injected SCSI sense data that I just shoved in there. Um, another thing you can do. Uh, so this particular test will say, OK, on a read, I want you to return a medium error. And I only want you to return the medium error for a certain LBA range. And so that's what I'm going to inject here. And then. OK, so I got an input-output error after reading from the device. And do a D message, and what do you see here but a medium error? So that's uh, kind of at the, uh, OK, so you kind of see the, the medium error down at the bottom. So you can set patterns and responses in the error injection code. So that's an example of error injection. And anyway, this is all done on a laptop, but let me show you actual real hardware. So this is a um, FreeBSD system talking to a FreeBSD target back in Colorado. And uh, they're connected by a Q-Logic fiber channel. And I've got a bunch of ones here, FreeBSD ones. You can see there are tons of them. 
And these are all virtual ones. Uh, some of them are uh, RAM disks, and some of them are actual block devices. Ones 20 through 24 are um, uh, uh, RAM disks in the first you know, 0 through 19 are block devices. So you can do things like, you know, what is it? DA6 is the first one. Yeah, you can just read off of, and this is reading off a disk on the other end of the line. And then let me show you what it looks like on the target side when I do a bunch of I.O. So we have 20, 26, 30, and 51 through 55. Running out of room here. Okay, so I just started a bunch of DD processes, and then over here, um, CTL comes with the CTL stat utility, and you can see I'm getting, you know, 800 and something megabytes a second uh, out of it. So, anyway. You can see the read, write, and total throughput with CTL stat, and that gives you an idea of what your overall system is, is doing. And let's go back over here and go real quick through the to-do list. Uh, there are a few things we need to do uh, for CTL. I mean, there's probably lots we could do, but uh, it needs to be buildable as a module. Right now it's got some issues with the unload routine it doesn't fully clean everything up, and that needs to be fixed. Uh, we ought to use DevStat for statistics collection. Right now, CTL Stat uses a um, statistics collection uh, setup that I invented myself. Like I said, this was originally written for Linux, so I had to kind of reinvent the wheel in terms of CAM and DevStat and a number of other things that are just, you know, that weren't there in Linux. A ZFS arc backend for CTL, and uh, that would allow us to not have to copy data into the ARC. You know, if we're able to just allocate ARC buffers and DMA directly into and out of them, uh, it would probably speed things up a little bit, be a little more efficient. Uh, use CAM CCBs instead of a CTLIO structure. Uh, that would uh, keep us from having to allocate another unit of I.O. as we go down through the stack. Uh, flesh out high availability support. I talked about that earlier. Um, allow sending status back with data, the final data on reads. And that speeds, uh, lowers the latency, uh, gives you higher IOPS uh, for read throughput. Multi-thread CTL command processing, and again, that's about higher IOPS. Um, and use a more standard SG list format and uh, more driver support. So questions? Um, a map IO. Uh, that, oh, that would be good to do. Yeah, we, it needs to be in the to-do list. I neglected to put that in there, but yes, we should do it. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. The question was, uh, are we going to do un SCSI unmap support for CTL? And the answer is, yeah, we should. And if Alexander or somebody wants to do it, great. I mean, I, you know, I have kind of variable amounts of time to work on it. It just depends on what you know, my employer has me doing at the moment. Sometimes I go work on it, and sometimes I'm working on something else. But yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what Alexander, the other Alexander, is talking about is uh, he and I have discussed. Uh, putting CTL on top of Fusion I.O. boards. And the Fusion I.O. boards uh, do support trim or unmap, same idea. And so we would want to be able to pass the trim or unmap command all the way down into the Fusion I.O. board. It's very important for flash devices to, to have that uh, working correctly. And I know we have uh, trim 
roadmap coming out of ZFS. So you know, hopefully we can get it through our entire I.O. stack soon. Alexander's done some uh, good work on that in the BA driver. Hopefully we can get it through the whole stack soon. Pavel. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there, you know, like Pavel said, there are benefits to having trim through the entire stack. And if we can get trim going all the way up and down, then, you know, we can free up files and virtual machine images as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, why doesn't it work? Or. Yes. Yeah, it, it'll communicate between, well, the problem is there's no communication framework. So we've got it, it's the stub, there's a stubbed out API that is defined to nothing. What essentially, essentially what I did is I took the uh, Copan HA callouts and I made them, you know, null functions, you know, just defined them out to nothing. Mm -hmm. um, it could be. I, I haven't, uh, to tell you the truth, I haven't looked enough at Hass to see if it, if it would map well. No, I don't. So, but Hass may be, may be the solution. It may be that we, you know, plug that into CTL or hook CTL into Hass to do the communication between machines. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. So I'm not sure. Other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Ken at freeb.